con men, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool, and calculating, they betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes, and uncover how they were brought dramatically to justice. In this show, the story of a man who callously conned his local community out of more than 200,000 pounds. In true psychopathic fashion, Glenn Rycroft cold-heartedly manipulated his friends, his family and his community by doing the unthinkable, pretending he had cancer. And without doubt in my mind, Glenn Rycroft's one of Britain's biggest con men. I think for any of us, the idea of telling your mother that you've got cancer and only a limited period of time of life left is just appalling if it's just not true. He's hurt me, he's hurt my family, and he's hurt an awful lot of other people as well. We're talking about people who he'd known for a very, very long time, some people who'd actually assisted him in his career, people who assisted him throughout his education, and you're talking about people who lost their life savings. And it was a horrible feeling to have that someone who's told you they've got cancer and you're thinking, uh, you know, maybe they haven't. If you can't trust this guy, who can you trust? Glenn Rycroft grew up in Salford, near Manchester, in England. After leaving school, he went on to become an air steward for British Airways. Glenn Rycroft was, in his early 20s, worked for British Airways, had a good job, um, and, and very, very likeable character, very personable with people, and very, very, very popular. He was extremely plausible. He was a nice, likeable lad. He felt somewhere along the line that he was a guy that had come out of a bad background. Salford isn't the best of places to be, but was starting to make something for himself. He was setting up pension plans in the form of small businesses that he could retire on when he finished flying. No one had a wrong word to say about him, and obviously it came as a total shock of what he was actually doing because he was so personable and likeable. Personable and likeable, necessary traits for a successful confidence trickster, Rycroft was to become a master. His tissue of deceit began in the year 2000, long before his cruel cancer claims. He began his conman career with a straightforward and plausible financial scam. He started to approach friends and family, offering them the opportunity of a lifetime, a chance to invest in a lucrative British Airways share scheme. The only trouble was the share scheme was totally fictitious. The plan was simple. People gave Rycroft money to invest on their behalf, and Rycroft pocketed all the so-called invested cash for himself. He was a steward and said that he'd been given this opportunity to invest his own money in British Airways, but he'd invest it on behalf of them through himself. The theory of it was that if you invest for a short term, it was slightly less, a longer term would be more. But in general, you were looking at around about a 12-month turnaround and around about 20 or 23% of return on investment depending on the type of deal that you were doing, the amount that you put in. The majority of all his family and friends invested money in him, uh, with expecting a return for the money within a six month to 12 month period. The whole thing was an underhand scam. The scheme didn't exist, but because Rycroft had targeted people he knew, they trusted him. Little did they know that their money was being used to pay for Rycroft's newfound high-flying lifestyle. The fact that Glenn Rycroft targeted his friends and family, local businessmen, was quite clever in as much as they already trusted him. They knew he worked for BA, uh, so there was an element of truth in the lies that he told which made them more plausible. It's kind of a version of what we call a high-yield investment scheme, um, which is where you basically con people into believing that you're offering them a unique opportunity where they can get um, 
really high returns, much higher returns they could get through any legitimate means. And it's a classic instance of something that seems too good to be true. Of course it is, but people don't, don't see it that way. They, they, either because they trust the con man or because also because they're misled by their own greed. I would say that had Glenn Rycroft come up to a stranger's house, knocked on his door at eight o'clock some evening and tried to sell this BA investment scam, people would have seen through it. Uh, as with a lot of fraudsters who were successful, uh, it's the initial contact and the initial hurdles of trust that they need to get over. Glenn Rycroft didn't need to do that. The trust and the belief in him was already there. One of his best friend's uh, parents, uh, well, his, his best friend's parents invested their life savings with him, uh, cash, uh, because he, they trusted him so much. And then it was a self-referral from there, really. It stayed generally within the, within the family circle, but then some of the families in, introduced other people into it, friends of theirs who, who, who Glenn Rycroft didn't know, and they also invested on the trust that we were getting from the family of how, how reliable he was. In retrospect, it all seems very irrational that we could believe this, but at the time, he's a young guy, he's the right age, he's got the right kit, he's doing all the right things. From our perspective, he was an air steward and a bright, cheerful and very respectable guy. Absolutely, totally and utterly believable. One of the businesses Rycroft bought with the money was a newsagent's. He leased the property from Granville Gough, and Glenn Rycroft calculatingly presented himself as a consummate young professional to draw Gough into his devious scam. We met him occasionally to talk about different things, one of which was the investment scheme, and he would turn up smart as a new pin, blue jacket on, hat under the arm, BA tie, ready to go flying. He was on his way down to Manchester Airport to catch the shuttle down to get his flight out. And to all intents and purposes, he was a BA man through and through. And we had no reason to believe otherwise. It wasn't long before Granville Goff was presented with the opportunity to invest in Rycroft's devious scheme. He suggested there was a way of being involved with his British Airways pension schemes. It seemed to be a good idea. It was offering a good rate of return. It seemed a pretty secure company to be with. And as a consequence, we got involved. He had quite a considerable number of investors, some of them uh, quite substantial amounts of money. And basically, when I asked what we were talking about in the way of substantial amounts of money, he said that at the moment he's got around about £600,000 invested of various different people as well as his own. So the 10000 that I was looking at, just to try it out, seemed to be pretty small beer. Friends, family and neighbours believed their money would yield a large return on their investment, depending upon the amount they initially spent. Little did they know that their return would be zero and their invested cash would just vanish. The money was used to, uh, to fund an extravagant lifestyle, not for himself, but he actually treated his friends as well, but invariably it was basically going on trips around the world, renting a luxury apartment in Worsley, um, having all mod comms in the apartment, uh, rental vehicles, buying into businesses, uh, you name it, he basically uh, had his hand in everything. When Glenn Rycroft was working for the cabin crew for British Airways, he might well have seen things that really drove him to aspire to that sort of lifestyle. And I think quite often with con artists, it's not just about the material aspects, it's more about what money and status and things like that represent, so it's respect. It's more the idea of a lifestyle, and he might well have picked up on all that when he was, when he was in the cabin crew. He went to the Bahamas, he went to Portugal, he went to Paris a number of times. Uh, and he was driving around America, I think he went there for two to three weeks, took friends with him and spent thousands. His friends clearly thought Rycroft's investments were doing well for him in order to be able to afford to treat them to these lavish holidays. Uh, and to give an indication of the, the whim of this particular character, he flew to Florida from the Bahamas purely and simply because it was overcast one day. Now, he treated some friends and took them out there completely free of charge to them. He footed the bill, and it was all stolen money that he'd conned out of people. He flew to Australia. He flew to several locations in America. 
and, and he stayed in the best resorts. He stayed at a five-star golfing resort in Portugal. He doesn't even play golf. You know, so this is the extravagant and arrogant existence that this man carried out. But the lucrative con did not have an exit strategy. People were expecting a return on the money they'd invested. With the clock ticking and the pressure on, Rycroft was in danger of being exposed as a fraud and a criminal. And so, many believe in an act of desperation and impulse, he played his cruel masterstroke. To evade, or at least postpone detection, Rycroft did the unimaginable. He lied to his nearest and dearest, telling them he was terminally ill. It obviously started coming on top for Glenn Rycroft, where he would have to start paying money back. So to uh, enforce, really, the deception, really, and facilitate him getting more money, he actually uh, came up with the story that he was suffering from brain cancer. Glenn Rycroft was living the high life in Salford, Greater Manchester, in the UK. Working as an air steward, Rycroft approached his friends, family and neighbours with an amazingly lucrative but completely fictitious British Airways investment scheme. With his nearest and dearest expecting the rewards of the scheme at any time, Rycroft was now in danger of being cornered and caught out. There was always going to be a fatal flaw because it had to come to an end. You know, he had a relationship with these people and they wanted to see a return on their investment and that just wasn't going to happen. So he clearly hadn't thought of an exit strategy for this con. A new con was born out of his BA scam in an ingenious but short-sighted exit strategy. Rycroft avoided paying out the money he owed by claiming he had cancer. In November 2000, Glenn Rycroft left his job as a cabin crew member using another lie. This time, that his mother had cancer. A month later, Rycroft told his investors, friends and family a different lie. He was on sick leave and had a cancerous brain tumour. Coming up to when people started expecting a return on the funds, um, it obviously started coming on top for Glenn Rycroft, where he, he would have to start paying money back. So to uh, enforce, really, the deception, really, and facilitate him getting more money, he actually uh, came up with the story that he was suffering from brain cancer and he'd been diagnosed and it was, it was potential that he was going to die. He came back, apparently, rather abruptly from one of his uh, many meandering trips and said that uh, he'd been diagnosed as uh, having terminal cancer with probably less than 12 months to live. Using cancer as a con has got to be the bottom of the barrel. It really is the most appalling way of taking money from other people. Choosing cancer as his disease of choice, just in terms of the mechanics of his actual con, it's quite well suited because you can drag it out for a long time, but you can always be on death's door at the same time. Um, and then plausibly you could need treatment in various other places and, and have to, to travel. So it really ticked all his boxes in that sense. Um, in terms of the psychology of his victims, uh, well, uh, cancer is, is a very, it's still a tender point. It's something that isn't talked about a great deal. Because it's quite a taboo area, it probably maintains quite a lot of mystery around it. So therefore it makes sense in terms of the psychology of his victims. They're not likely to probe too much. They're not, not likely to ask too many questions, too many awkward questions. So in that sense, it, it's quite a, it's a really good choice. It's just something that you, you find very hard to come to terms with. I mean, just think of your own loved ones. Can you imagine going home tonight and saying to them, look, I've got uh, two months to live, I'm dying of a brain tumour. Just think of the emotion and the difficulty uh, that, uh, that that would uh, that would take. It, it's just unbelievable that anybody would stoop to such a you know a, a callous uh, and calculated deception as that. But this this lad did, uh, and he did it with no remorse whatsoever. But it's torturous. I would have thought on his mother because his mother's a nice person. Same with his sisters. They're nice. I think for any of us, the idea of telling your mother that you've got cancer and only a limited period of time of life left is just appalling if it's just not true. I mean, none of us could really understand how someone can do that unless you have this sort of psychopathic tendency to detach yourself emotionally from the situation. No one's going to ask a dying man, no one's going to ask him difficult questions about a business plan, no one's going to put him on the spot in terms of coughing up money that they've invested. So you could argue that that's a sort of diabolical way of 
sidestepping the consequences of his initial scam. I'm not sure that he was necessarily that calculating because quite often psychopaths aren't. In fact, he said himself that when he claimed to have cancer, it was just something that just occurred to him. He didn't know why he did it. He just started saying that. I think Glenn Rycroft exhibits quite a few traits of a psychopath. He has this emotional detachment, lack of conscience, and the ability to con people that he knew and who loved him. With the cancer con successfully born out of his British Airways scam, Rycroft was safe for now. And like any master con man, Rycroft thoroughly researched his subject matter, so he was utterly convincing. His initial research into disease, the symptoms, the treatments, was all painstakingly taken on board by him. We know from speaking to close associates who were victims and witnesses in the case that he used to spend quite a lot of time on the internet. So the World Wide Web is a, is a, is a, a reservoir of, of endless information that he researched. Uh, he also purchased um, medical books um, specifically about oncology and similar subjects, medicines that people might use for treatment and, and the like. And he created quite a plausible scenario for people to believe. And most of us are very sympathetic and have empathy for people who have serious illness. To facilitate this stage of the con, Rycroft ensured no one questioned his fictional illness. And he audaciously began to dramatically and disturbingly display the symptoms of a man with cancer. In order to uh, convince people of his illness, Rycroft would look very gaunt. He would tell people he was tired and not feeling well. He would display um, hair loss. He actually shaved his head and gave people the general impression that he'd received chemotherapy. There was one particular evening that one of the witnesses recounts they were in the home and Rycroft went out of the lounge only to return several minutes later screaming in pain and, and displaying what looked like blood running from his ears, his nose, his eyes and his mouth. We now know that he actually went to a joke shop uh, in Manchester and purchased uh, fake blood capsules. And, and when I spoke to the, uh, the individuals about that, they were sure uh, so shocked and traumatised uh, being suddenly confronted with this, that they, that even today they find it hard to come to terms with that somebody could be so callous as to do something like that. Not content with disturbing and upsetting those closest to him, he then set about conning them out of their cash. Rycross friends and associates were so trusting of him that when he confronted them with, with symptoms, um, that they accepted anything that he was prepared to say. Bearing in mind that Rycroft was saying that he was receiving treatment from the National Health Service and from Bupa, he was quoting these medical organisations to his friends. And what would happen is they would do what he asked. And if he said, I don't need an ambulance, they wouldn't get one. He, he, he would say that this is all part of the, the symptoms and, and, and to trust him, uh, which is what people did. They were really taken in by him. It was quite clear that he could just lie on the cuff. I mean, some of the some of the stories he'd come up with are absolutely, you know, to this date, when I've sat here now three, four years down the line, are still unbelievable and still amaze me when I think back about what he used to say, yeah. Uh, he would just, anything at all, he would lie about anything and have no qualms about the type or how extravagant the lie was. It wouldn't bother him what, one, one little bit. People gave uh, to what they firmly believe was a was a, a an honest and, and worthy cause, uh, and that would be to uh, try and finance the private research and treatment of Glenn Rycroft, believing genuinely that he was a, he was a cancer sufferer. In all honesty, I thought it was a genuine a attempt to raise money for a lad who was on death's doorstep. It was just a tissue of of lies and deceit. That, that he wove to convince people of his illness. In true psychopathic fashion, Rycroft convinced his community that nothing could be done for him in Britain. But a letter from a fictitious Professor Knowles stated there was hope elsewhere, with a hefty price tag. He'd actually identified that there was a treatment in Australia that uh, wasn't recognised by the British Medical Board, but it was very, very uh, expensive, £250,000, and needed money to go over, because that was possibly his only chance of actually uh, being able to beat the condition that he had. He managed to get hold of a letter-headed paper from Steppenhill Hospital, and have it copied 
onto blank paper, obviously, at uh, a local stationery's. Um, from there, he typed up a letter confirming from a, an alleged uh, consultant professor that he had this condition that he was purported to have. Wycroft targeted local business people, including Ray Fisher, to help fund his bogus treatment and Glenn Rycroft looked every inch the cancer victim. It was a family friend who introduced Glenn to myself and mentioned that he was poorly and he was looking for anyone who could make a, a donation for some treatment in Australia. Well, he turned up at the office, he had a baseball cap on, he'd pulled down over his face, he'd lost a lot of weight, he didn't look well. We had a letter from Stepping Hill Hospital from a specialist saying that he has a brain tumour and he said the treatment is available, but not in this country. There's one chance he's got of getting out to Australia and getting the treatment paid for privately because it's not available in Britain on the NHS. And the letter was signed by some professor from Stepping Hill. Like many others, Ray Fisher fell for the scam and agreed to help a dying man. I was getting updated phone calls saying he needs 150, 350, then it was coming back down. Someone else had donated some, so I was getting like a running commentary on how much he needed. And I think the final amount was 30,000. I said, well, I can't run to 30, but I can run to 15. As the morning approached him to come and pick the check up, it was all done over mobiles. So it was all getting the last ambers at work, I'm getting my on the landline, I'm getting my on the mobile phone. He said he needs the money, he's got a plane waiting at the airport, like an, like an idiot, I, I fell for it. Rycroft told some of his victims that he had a plane on standby and that therefore it was waiting for him and he needed the money quickly, he needed them to act quickly. And that's a classic form of what's called deadlining in con game parlance, which is a form of a hurry up. It's, it's a way of pressuring people into um, giving you the money quickly so they don't have time to have any doubts, they don't have time to think twice about things, they just have to act and they act on the, the rationalisation they've already made, which they trust you and they want to help you. So by deadlining them, you make them cough up there and then. He said he had the airplane waiting at Manchester Airport to fly him straight off. So I didn't think there was any breathing time at all. It was just sheer pressure what he put us under. People started actually investing into a trust where, where he could receive treatment to try and save his life. Um, and it just facilitated really that deception again and he still maintained his lifestyle because now the money wasn't coming in for the investments, it was coming in for his cancer treatment. The new phase of the con was successfully up and running and Rycroft again started to see the world on other people's money. People thought they were funding Rycroft in a desperate bid to save his life, sending him around the world to meet with leading cancer experts and to be treated with groundbreaking remedies. The reality was he was using the charitable donations to enjoy extravagant holidays. He would often take along his friends who believed they were supporting Rycroft through gruelling treatments. They didn't know that the whole scenario was in fact a cruel, manipulative scam and that they, like everyone else, were actually being betrayed. While abroad with friends, Ben Rycroft was careful to never let the facade of the tragic cancer victim slip. He would disappear on the pretense that he was going to have potentially life-saving treatments and his friends were none the wiser. He would sometimes return with physical signs that he'd undergone treatment. On one occasion, he returned with a ball patch on the back of his shaved head to represent surgery. It was all a con. To facilitate that deception, he would disappear for days on end, saying he'd go for it. the treat. He wanted to go for it on his own. He didn't want them to put through. It was very painful treatment, etc. So he'd give them money and say, "Look, you look after yourself for two days, and I'll go away." And he'd basically go and book into a motel or another hotel. Every time he went over there, he always stayed at five-star resorts, uh, you know, and, and, and lived the high life. None of Glenn Rycross' friends wanted to speak about their experiences in this documentary. I think in Glenn Rycroft's case, it was a combination of the financial gain, but also living that high life. And the sympathy and empathy that was being poured in, on him by other people was obviously irresistible as well. The reliance on the kindness of his community would inevitably become his downfall. Back in Salford, Greater Manchester, England, the local community were taking matters into their own hands. Rycroft had underestimated their generosity and the number of people now rallying to his cause. 
When he started the cancer story, basically it went out of his control then because family and friends involved other people outside of that circle of trust that he'd created where everything that he could set in there was believable. By expanding the pool of his victims, he was running a big risk because um, by restricting them to friends and family, he, he had an automatic uh, failsafe, if you like, which is that they're much less likely to doubt him because they trust him already, whereas outsiders are much more likely to be suspicious. And that's a general rule in con games, is that the fewer you pe people you can involve, the better, basically. I don't think he realised that he it, it would get as much attention as he did get when he, he came up with the story that he was dying of cancer. In order to raise money for his life-saving treatments, a benefit night was organised at the local rugby club that he used to work at. That night, in honour of Glenn Rycroft, would be the evening that exposed his web of lies and secured his downfall. I spent a sleepless night. I mean, can you imagine? I live in a local community where everybody knows this chap and I'm going to be the one that says, uh, well, actually, I don't think this chap's got cancer. Former air steward Glenn Rycroft had swindled his local community of Salford, Greater Manchester, England, out of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Firstly, by offering them the chance to invest in a fictitious British Airways bond scheme, and then by claiming he had a cancerous brain tumour. He was very, very convincing, very, very personable guy. And consequently, you would talk with him, discuss things with him, totally and completely believe in the things he was describing. And to suddenly find out that the whole thing was fraudulent, completely and utterly devastating. If you can't trust this guy, who can you trust? But Glenn Rycroft's cancer con couldn't go on forever, and soon it was to come crashing down. Rycroft's bubble eventually burst, uh, and it, it burst on the, on the night at the premises behind me here, the Willows. This was as a result of a charitable event that had basically been organised by his family and friends. They put a huge amount of commitment into securing uh, uh, variety acts who were given of the services uh, next to nothing, for at no co cost to anybody. And, and it, it, on the face of it, it looked like it, it was going to be a tremendous evening and it would raise a lot of money. A night of entertainment, singing and fundraising, all in Rycroft's honour. But for once, Rycroft wasn't the most willing of beneficiaries and he was keeping his distance. He wasn't turning up for meetings. One of the organisers who, were orga who was organising the Variety Acts, he himself was a cancer sufferer and had tried to speak to Glenn about it to see whether he needed any counselling, any support and the like. And Rycroft was distant. He was careful not to speak to him simply because this man would have seen straight through his, his ruse and his deceptions. In another unexpected twist of fate, the compare for the night worked for British Airways, Rycroft's former employers. A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to Glen Rycroft's benefit evening. All the money raised this evening was all going to a very good cause. We've got some wonderful acts on. Debbie Henley also tried to speak to Glen Rycroft prior to the benefit evening. I did on several occasions try to contact him, um, but unfortunately I, I was unable to get hold of him on his mobile phone. Um, I eventually got hold of him and he was very curt with me on the phone. I put this down to the fact that maybe he was having treatment and wasn't very well. I explained to him that my job as a compare was to get as much money on the evening as I could for him and that um, we'd love to get British Airways involved. I had heard from the organisers that British Airways had given a large sum of money as, um, f as for tickets, etc., as a prize for the raffle and I said to Glenn, well, let's get hold of BA News, which is a company newspaper. British Airways employees are, are exceptionally generous and let's get hold of them, get them involved and get as much money as we can. Um, he then became very defensive and said that he didn't want British Airways News getting involved at all. And in fact, he'd heard that I worked for British Airways and didn't want me comparing the evening for him at all. Um, again, I found it... A 
a bit odd, but put it down to the fact that he wasn't well. And I just explained to him that unfortunately I would be the lady that was doing the evening. And, um, you know, we need, my job was to get as much money as I possibly could for him. But this was just the beginning of Debbie Henley's suspicions. On a few occasions, I'd asked, would Glenn be available at the rehearsal so that I could have a chat with him, you know, see if he thought he'd be OK for the evening to come and collect his cheque, um, or did he want somebody else involved? Um, and on many occasions, people would tell me that Glenn wouldn't be there. He was um, having two and three amounts of radiotherapy per day, and unfortunately, you know, he wasn't well enough um, to attend the evening. Um, on a few occasions, um, people would say that he'd gone to have his treatment and I'd ask, well, you know, who's bringing him home with family helping him? And he'd say, no, he's driving himself home after the treatments because it's very upsetting for people to see him in such a state. He'd rather not upset anybody and, you know, keep it all to himself. What basically happened was that several people involved in the organisation started to have slight concerns, not something they could specifically put the finger on. But little things started to, to add up and add up, and when I was chatting to people, different little things that, you know, British Airways had loaned him £30,000 for um, treatment. Now, British Airways are a very, very generous company, and they do look after their employees wonderfully. However, they're not a charity either that, you know, you imagine the amount of people that do fall in in a company, they couldn't do this for everybody, and it, it all seemed a little bit odd. We then heard that he'd been out to Australia um, to get life-saving treatment, and this clinic that he'd gone to did have a cure for cancer, but Glenn had had to sign a contract to say that he would never divulge where this co um, company was or um, the kind of treatment that he'd had. That's when alarm bells started to go that I thought, well, whoa, there's somebody out there with a cure for cancer and, you know, they're not sharing it with everybody. Rycroft's cruel cancer con was about to unravel and crash down around him. I think the final straw was when a chap came up to me, one of the organisers, and we were just chatting briefly about the evening and how it was going. And he said, you know, British Airways are such a marvellous company, aren't they? Glenn was telling me that they've got a jet on standby to take him anywhere in the world should a cure for cancer come up. And I think that was when the penny dropped and I thought, even the chief executive of British Airways would not have a jet on standby, it's just... It's just not on, it wouldn't happen ever. And that was when I thought, there's something not right. And it was a horrible feeling to have that someone who's told you they've got cancer and you're thinking, uh, you know, maybe they haven't. Obviously, she worked for British Airways, you know, the British Airways would never do anything like that. And that's where really the skepticism crept in and people started asking questions. And from there, it snowballed really. I spoke to one of the organisers at the Willows and I said, there's just something not right here. And one of the organisers said to me, yeah, we kind of feel that, that, you know, it could, you know, that there is something untoward going on. Uh, I said, well, I'm going to have to speak to British Airways tomorrow. I spent a sleepless night. I mean, can you imagine? I live in a local community where everybody knows this chap and I'm going to be the one that says, uh, well, actually, I don't think this chap's got cancer. When I did finally ring uh, British Airways and speak to them, and they told me that, you know, Glenn no longer... Because everybody in the community still presumed that Glenn worked for British Airways, that Glenn hadn't worked for the company for some months. It was just awful. It was just sickening. Positive now of foul play, Debbie phoned the police, but with the benefit the next day, the show just had to go on. Well, we went ahead with the evening and when I got up on the stage to thank everybody for coming, I did explain to them we would be giving all the money that evening to Pendlebury Children's Hospital. And there were a few ums and ahs and a few people wondering, well, you know, I've come for Glenn. Um, but that was the only way that we could get the evening to go ahead. It was then that the full extent of the cold-hearted con started to become clear. 
when I came off the stage after the raffle, there was a, a queue of people waiting to speak to me. It's a small community around here. It doesn't take long for people to find out what you do for a living. And there was a lady waiting there and she said, you know, I believe you work for British Airways. So I said, yes, I do. She said, um, well, would you let me know how my shares are doing? She said, because Glenn took my money a few months ago and I've been trying to contact him and he's not got back to me to let me know when I'll be getting all my money. And my stomach, I could physically have been sick because I just then thought, this is bigger, this is bigger than any of us thought. So I said, well, actually, I haven't any idea about your British Airways um, shares, but if you give me a name and address, I'll take your name and address and I'll get straight back to you. Behind her was somebody else. Behind her was somebody else. In the end, there was about nine people queuing up to ask how their British Airways shares were doing. And I didn't have a clue, you know, I certainly, I've worked for the company for 20 years and I certainly didn't know anything about any British Airways shares. The whole thing just started to unwind and once it started to unravel, it became <laughs> a total nightmare. He went from being the good guy to being just unbelievably involved in any number of dirty tricks. And that really is very, very disturbing. After the evening was over, I was back in the dressing room behind the stage and a gentleman came to me and said, Glenn's here and he wants to speak to his compare. Um, to which, again, my stomach was already in knots anyway. I just went around the curtain and looked down the room and there was a willowy figure of a man at the back with a hat on. and. I just couldn't speak to him. I was just so appalled by what had gone on that evening and I, I just couldn't speak to him at all. I just went back into the dressing room. And Debbie Henley's worst fears were soon proven right. I spoke to the, uh, the management here at the Willows and um, they told me that uh, because of slight suspicions some of the organisers had been having, uh, they had actually uh, asked uh, Rycroft to produce a letter from his, uh, his, his, his doctor. Uh, a letter was produced uh, and that was presented to me when I first came to it and it was purporting to be from a Professor Knowles of Stepping Hill Hospital in Stockport. The British Medical Association told us that there was no such person as Professor Knowles, certainly not working at Stepping Hill Hospital and certainly not involved in the, in the field of oncology. In fact, not only was the doctor fictitious, but Stepping Hill Hospital, Stockport, England, didn't even have a cancer department. Rycroft was arrested on suspicion of fraud by the police and interviewed. He was told he was being arrested on suspicion of deception and uh, he made a full uh, and frank admission to us there and then. Uh, in, in the, in the, uh, Travelling back to the station, he actually suggested, quite unsolicited, that uh, it, it, was a, it was a pack of lies. And uh, in the uh, subsequent interviews that we conducted with him under caution, uh, with the solicitor present, he fully admitted that he never had cancer, um, uh, the British Airways investment uh, bonds never existed. He made a complete, full and frank admission of the criminal uh, actions that he'd uh, carried out. During the house search, not only did we recover these medical uh, journals with highlighted areas in which, which highlighted the conditions he had, we also recovered receipts for blood capsules per purchased from a joke shop which would have been conducive with him collapsing and blood pouring from his nose and uh, mouth which his family witnessed and the word quickly spread around the community. The next thing I find out is that there are, in actual fact, an awful lot of other people that have been in the same situation who have invested with the uh, BA scheme. And essentially, this was a completely new and separate scam to the cancer scam that had initially caused the problems to come to light. The whole thing's been a scam. So I didn't feel too, we didn't really sink in. I didn't, I didn't feel too bothered about the money at that time. But it's only when everything else comes to light and the way you think you've been deceived and manipulated, that's, I think that's what hurt the most, being taken for the mug. 
on leaving the police station, I remember quite vividly saying to him that you need to go and tell your mother and your family that you're not dying. You've got to uh, make a clean rest of things and be honest with them. And he assured me that he would do that. Rycroft, seemingly unable to keep his promise and face his family, in a cruel twist decided to genuinely take himself to death's door. What he'd done, he'd gone out that night and put petrol on himself in his motor car and deliberately crashed it into the central reservation on the M62 motorway over in West Yorkshire. Glenn Rycroft cruelly conned and manipulated his friends, his family, and his local community of Salford, Greater Manchester, England. Rycroft's first con started in the year 2000. He convinced people to invest in a bogus investment scheme where he used people's life savings to fund his extravagant lifestyle. The following year, when it looked as if Rycroft was in danger of being caught, he did the unthinkable. He lied and told his nearest and dearest he was dying of cancer. In a dramatic twist, when the scam was uncovered, Rycroft seemed unable to cope with the revelation and decided to really try to end his life. He'd been in the police station more or less all day, but that evening had jumped in his car, driven over the other side of the Pennines, um, and had a serious attempt to commit suicide. Doused the car with petrol, driven it into the Armco barrier, turned it over, set it on fire. A van which was following had screeched to a halt and the guys inside it had leapt out without thought for themselves and pulled him out of the burning wreckage. It would be easy to read that as a kind of gesture of remorse, but I'm not sure that that would be right because given the appalling things this guy tried to pull off, he obviously didn't really have much of a conscience. I don't think remorse was in his vocabulary. So one suspects that it wasn't really to do with remorse, it was maybe more to do with panic or embarrassment, um, or, or it's just as part of his psychopathy, it's about acting on impulse quite often. This seemed to be his solution rather than facing the consequences to put an end to it. Difficult to say, but in some respects, it may have been better for all of us if he had. With the man who claimed he had cancer now lying in hospital, it was left to Detective Sergeant Steve Retford to break the news to Glenn Rycross family that their son and brother had never actually had cancer. I was confronted the next day with a call, a physical call. She came to the police station of his mother and one of his sisters when they were asking what on earth uh, Glenn had been up to. And I, I simply said to them, has he not explained to you? Has he not explained to you what, what the arrest yesterday was all about? Clearly he hadn't done. One act that any police officer when they join the job finds very, very difficult is delivering a death message to somebody to say that the nearest and dearest has just been killed in a road tracker collision or industrial accident or the like. I had an experience in reverse in that I told his mother and one of his sisters that their son and, and brother was not going to die in several weeks' time from a brain tumour. And the reaction from his mother and his sister were, were similar reactions um, uh, that you would say to somebody if they just lost somebody. Uh, they were absolutely distraught. They were, they were, they were both in tears. Uh, it took some, some time before they could compose themselves and I could speak to them. They thought that he was dying and, and it was just a pack of lies. And they were absolutely decimated by the news, that, albeit good news, that he wasn't going to die. They, they thought he was. And this is the way that this character deceived his own family. With Rycroft's recovery came the court case, and in December 2003, 27-year-old Glenn Rycroft stood trial in Manchester, England. Although pleading guilty to 25 of the 30 charges of deception, Glenn Rycroft refused to take responsibility for his actions and the devastation he had caused. Instead, he turned the tables on his community and claimed that his actions were as a result of being brainwashed by a local cult called the community of free spirits. He claims that he'd been manipulated by a local cult group run by a neighbor of his for many years since in fact he was a small child. 
Rycroft's shocking and disturbing claims that he had been abused and controlled from a young age by a neighbour were fully investigated by the police and once again his words were found to be nothing more than malicious and vicious lies. The fact that he came up with this uh, explanation in court saying that he'd been influenced by a cult was just the last in a whole long line of lies. It was yet another lie thinking on his feet to try and get himself out of his situation. But it certainly sounds in keeping with the pattern of a psychopath or a sociopath, which is what you might call confabulation, which is when you make up stories, but really on, on the spur of the moment, you sort of, you're just improvising as you go along. And it does sound like the desperate last throw of the dice of, of a cornered con man is, is to try and pull yet another, yet another con, basically, and another, some more sleight of hand to say, oh, actually, all along, it wasn't what it seemed, it was something else altogether. And so, in a way, he was trying to pull his biggest con. I think the fact that the judge threw it out meant that he had truly been exposed for what he was and was nobody was prepared to believe anything he said anymore. It was the end of the road for Glenn Rycroft and his emotionally manipulative lies. His dramatic and unfounded claims of an inexplicable cult controlling his every whim were rejected by the judge and the callous cancer con man received a custodial sentence. At the trial, he, uh, Glenn Rycroft pleaded guilty to 25 counts of deception and received a four-year sentence, which is a good sentence for uh, deception offences. And I think the, the reason for that is because of the damage he'd done to charitable organisations in the Salford community. The judge described Glenn Rycroft as a mean, wicked and heartless con man. It is estimated he made £200,000 from his deceptions. We lost... 10,000 in cash. The rest of it is money that was set up to be made, which effectively vanished in the haze. Minimal money was ever recovered because of the lifestyle he, uh, he had. He was basically, well, he was, he was living a millionaire's lifestyle, flying out to any destination he wanted to, when he wanted to, and, and renting a flat that cost thousands of pounds uh, a month anyway. I think the biggest loss by an in individual victim was just over £50,000. Collectively, it, it was between 200 and 250,000 pounds. So in the bigger um, picture of things, you might say that there are con men around who've secured far in excess of that. I would agree with that, but what I would agree where Rycroft is right up there with the, the cruelest and, and biggest con men is the fact that um, it's the scams that he used to tell somebody, your nearest and dearest, that you are dying of cancer and have got limited what, weeks, months to live, when it's a complete pack of lies, is it's, it says a lot about the individual. I think the reason that cancer was used as a scam was because nobody would question it. It's one of those taboo subjects that you could never believe that anybody would wish it on themselves or even pretend that they had it. It's one of those areas that nobody would ever question. And I think that is why he got away with it for as long as he did. The, the community fell for it, his immediate family, his parents, his brothers, his sisters, his in-laws, his best friends, uh, all fell for it. Um, and that's why they all, all of them, were, were, were victims of Glen Rycroft, really. And Salford was a victim at the end of it because it's obviously harmed Salford in relation to future charity events. Glen Rycroft served two of his four-year sentence and has returned to Salford in England, a community that will never be the same after Rycroft's merciless manipulation of their charity and their goodwill. The damage you'd done in the Salford community, it created distrust in the community of any events that were coming up in the future. Uh, it would take a long time for, the, for that trust to come back. Um, it, it made them people who are all investing in it very sceptical in the future, investing in it again, so quite a substantial amount of damage I feel it done. As a community, the people were just absolutely gutted, especially business people who had, you know, invested or given money thinking that he was dying of cancer. You know, there was an element of embarrassment, there was anger, there was upset, especially for the people that he was very close to, that he'd, he'd conned. And almost the relief that, thank God he's not got cancer, but oh my God, 
you know, how has he done this to us? Why has he been able to do this? How has he been able to get away with this? You know, that's the big question I think everybody was asking. And I think some people, including myself, felt quite foolish. And they shouldn't feel foolish at all because, you know, the nature is that they did feel sorry and they wanted to help. Put me off making donations to anybody else. I still do little bits for charity and that, but I don't do anything as, as substantial as that. Glenn Rycroft still adamantly claims that his actions were the result of years of indoctrination into a secret cult within his community. A cult which no one has been able to find any evidence of. Like the judge who sentenced Rycroft to prison, most people are now certain that Rycroft is indeed a cruel, callous con man. He's hurt me, he's hurt my family, and he's hurt an awful lot of other people as well. Without doubt, one of the biggest uh, con men I've ever came, come across, because uh, and, it, and, it's, and the stories that he, he elaborated during the course of the investigation were unbelievable, you know, and, it, and still, as I said, still amazes him to this day, but... Um, and, you know, I, I think he's one of the people, you know, he, he's shown no remorse whatsoever for what he's done and, and thinks still that he's done the right thing. And uh, I could certainly well do without ever meeting anybody like that again. <laughs>